Okay, so I'm using um, Kerbal Engineer here, which gives a slightly different feed out to MechJeb. Uh, one thing it does quite nicely is also give you your current terminal velocity. So rather than having to rely on my little cheat sheet, I can just make sure that that terminal velocity is always uh, adhered to. So engage SAS and let's ascend. We're going to move across the 90 degree heading so we get the rotation of curve in, aiding us. That shaves off a little bit of delta V. We're going to be executing gravity turn about 8 or 9 kilometers and we're going to try and make this ascent as efficient as possible. Okay, here we go. So I'm now a bit over the terminal velocity, so I ease far back off the throttle. SAS keeping me on course. You see I get a nice little um, atmospheric efficiency readout just below the terminal velocity there. Um, beneath or over terminal velocity, that's obviously going to cause issues. So we're at 5 kilometers. as efficient as possible. Okay, pitch over 10 kilometers, a bit higher, but okay, pitched over a little bit too hard. This rocket's uh, thrust isn't quite up to par, so that should do it. I'm now at the point where I'm well over the terminal velocity, but I'm going to be decelerating a bit now because of the fact that I've lost all those extra engines. Apoapsis rising. I'm going to be careful here because this engine is... Uh, if I tip over too far, I'm going to lose the... Uh, the ship is going to basically just keep... the velocity is just going to keep falling away. So we're aiming for about 70, 80 kilometers. Try and pull it back a little bit. It's going to mean steering losses. We're afford to bring it down a bit now. Yeah, this is nowhere near as efficient as I would like, but this is the first time I've launched this rocket. So if we kill the thrust. Sometimes you've got to launch the same rocket a few times in order to be able to actually get a proper feel for how to actually launch it. So we're nearly out of the atmosphere. Okay, let's make our circularization burn. How much delta V do we have left? So we're going to need 1,200 delta V. That means that we're not going to have the 800 or so needed to get our injection. On the other hand, we have quite a bit spare in the lander, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Okay, so the estimated burn is 1 minute 13. So if we start burning at T minus 30 seconds, we should be fine. Start the burn. Okay. Burn's not going to be perfectly even, but it's going to be close enough that we can compensate with a little bit of maneuvering at the end of the burn. Circularizing out nicely. 
node is moving slightly, so I've got to keep in line with the node. Finger on the control button, ready to start reducing thrust so that we can keep that last bit. So we start reducing it now. And chase the node because the node's maneuver will automatically make corrections for our timing and kill it. Okay, let's check our orbit out. 94, 81. Uh, somewhat erratic, but we can work with it. Okay, first thing, F5, quick save. Quick save is your friend. You do not want to have to go through the same maneuvers every time. So whenever you finish a maneuver and you're pretty confident the maneuver was well executed, press F5 to quick save. If you cock it up, hold down F9 to quick load. Okay, so you can see here on the vessel display we have 600 meters per second of delta V left. We need 860 to get to the MUN, so we're going to be relying on using some of the Delta V from our uh, craft here. So 200, we should be all right. Now, we've, uh, the ascent was, again, as I say, wasn't perfect. We lost a lot to steering because I pitched the rocket over too quickly. So the amount, the thrust to weight ratio was too low at that time for the rocket to keep going at such a uh, sharp angle. So that was my cock up and I've paid for it by wasting about 200 meters per second of delta V. So the moral of the story is if your thrust to weight ratio isn't particularly high then whatever you do don't pitch over too quickly. Learn from my mistakes not your own. Okay so we set the moon as the target. The ascending node and descending node, you don't need to worry about them. These are for matching your orbit to the inclination of targets like Minmus. You don't need to worry about those at this time. So, what we need to do now is plot an intercept on the Moon. There are many ways of doing this. There is the Hoffman transfer, which is the most common way for doing interplanetary. But for local transfers, basically, you can just use the orbital planner. So we put the orbital planner node down, pump the delta V up to the point where we see the crosses the moon's orbit, and you'll see the target, you'll see the closest approaches here. This is where we will be at the closest approach, this is where the target will be at the closest approach. So if we maneuver this node around a little, and you can see eventually we'll hit a point. Now, so long as your projected orbit crosses the orbit of the moon at some point it will you will get an intercept you just need to keep moving it around and around and around until you get that intercept so what we can then do is put some retrograde on there and that will reduce our delta v requirement because all we're trying to do is hit the moon's sphere of influence so you can see here we don't even need to get up to the altitude of the moon we just need to hit its sphere of influence so this burn is in six minutes so if we lock to that node now, this ship's going to maneuver quite slowly because obviously it's quite long and it doesn't have uh, RCS thrusters or uh, an atmosphere to use the fins in. So let's line up and sassy. There we go. So, provided that we can follow this burn perfectly, or at least almost perfectly, which is going to be quite difficult, seeing as we have a stage separation in the middle of it, we should be okay and we should be able to get to the moon. So let's fast forward. And again, be careful with your time warps. It's better to spend a little bit of time staring at the screen than it is to miss your um, warp point. Especially because nodes tend to drift. So projected time is 33 seconds. It's actually going to take a lot less than that because when the staging kicks in our thrust to weight ratio is going to go whee! So I'm going to start this at about t minus 10 seconds I think. So this is one of the other things I really like about MechJeb is that it actually has a warp helper. Even if you're not using the um, 
core features, the autopilot as it were, the warp helper is extremely useful. So let's fire up the engines. And you see our orbit is starting to change shape. Keep your finger on the control key so you can ease off the throttle as soon as uh, as soon as you start getting to the required delta V expenditure. Because if you overshoot this, you're going to waste more delta V needing to recover from the overshoot. So that's it. Our stage is finished. So we need to press space to activate the next stage. You can tell the stage is finished because the delta V wasn't going down any further. Whoa! She's feisty. Alright, so let's reduce the throttle slightly. And as soon as we're watching our orbit here, as soon as it sinks, kill. Okay, so we have our intercept. In seven hours, we shall be at the moon. So let's deploy solar panels to make sure that we uh, can stay powered during the trip. See on the resources tab here, electrical... Mm. Oh, I beg your pardon, that was very rude of me. Electrical charge should be fine. Okay, so there's our little pod. Leaving behind our debris. Let's warp. Oh, no, before we warp, F5. Quick save. So you can, if you want, have a quick look at your um, ship while it's in travel. Look back at that pearl that is curving. Ooh, beautiful. This game can be so gorgeous sometimes. Let's see if we can spot the moon. There it is. So, okay, we're nearly there. Again, be careful with the warp. Now, what this here means, we get a moon encounter here, moving too fast to actually enter orbit. So we hit a periapsis there. We don't have an apoapsis because we don't have a low point in the orbit. Sorry, an apoapsis because we have a high point in the orbit because we're not in orbit. So, moon encounter, periapsis, no apoapsis because we're not in orbit, moon escape there. Basically, this means that we would enter into a highly elliptical orbit around Kerbin. So what we need to do is burn retrograde at this periapsis, and that will then put us into orbit around the Moon. So I'll show you, and it's a lot easier to do with the orbital planner. I'm also going to show you another little trick that I normally use when I'm doing Moon landings. Because I don't like going into orbit around the Moon and then landing, I prefer to do it all in one burn. So, see here, there we go. Now, this is switched relative to the moon, but what will happen is, as the moon moves past, our escape point is still going to be around about there. So if we hover over there, you can see that over here and over here, points line up. So the point where we escape the moon is there, and the point where the moon will be at that point is there. So let's plot a manoeuvre at the periapsis, burning retrograde. You see here, there we go, we can get an orbit, we get a nice circular orbit, and all it would cost us is 170 delta V. But what I like to do is this. Bring it to the periapsis is quite low, about 5 kilometres over the moon's surface. 639 metres. No, no, that's too low. 500... For the purpose of this tutorial, we'll go we're trying to aim for about 7. 8, 8. 7 to 2, 7, 9. That'll do the trick. And then what I do is I kill all of my horizontal velocity at that point so that the ship then goes straight down towards the moon. And because at this point nearly all of the velocity is horizontal, this means that your vertical velocity at this point would be zero. So you can then descend from an altitude of seven kilometers and you're only accelerating through seven kilometers of altitude. Now the payoff for that is that all through this you're accelerating. 
So if you were in a low lunar orbit, it's say 90 kilometers, and then you did this same maneuver, you wouldn't have such a high um, horizontal velocity to kill. But I personally find this a lot easier because the part of the descent that I find awkward is the vertical descent. I can never get it right. So by reducing the size of the vertical descent, I give myself less of an opportunity to cock up. But that's just me, and I would strongly advise you to check other moon landing tutorials, because there are other ways of doing this, and you may find something that suits you better. F5, save. And let's warp to this point. First off, let's get our maneuver nodes lined up. seconds, so we're looking at about 10. Okay, that was a bit ballsy, but uh, should be fine. Here we go! And again, got to keep an eye on this. Don't trust the manoeuvre node, because you're never going to get it perfect. Learn to eyeball it as well. So I'm going to start reducing thrust here for a bit more precision. So hover over that, I can see where it's going. I can kill the thrust there. Perfect. So that last bit was eyeball, that was me feathering between the throttle up button, which is shift, and the kill the engine button, which is X, and by hovering over the periapsis I can see it as it changes, and I get a lot, I get very precise control over it. F5 again, save. So what I'm going to do now is, once I hit the periapsis, I'm just going to kill all of my horizontal velocity by burning retrograde, and then I can land. Now the landing is the most difficult part. So, whoop. Again, all that acceleration. That's why you've got to be careful with the time warp. Okay, so we're approaching periapsis. Okay, we're close enough that I can plan for this. So let's move to retrograde. If we move away from the map screen, you will see we are going straight over the lunar surface. Press G to put down my landing gears. I will retract my panels for safety purposes. I'm already pointed retrograde. Let's throttle up. And you can see that my surface velocity is decreasing very quickly. There's my delta V there plummeting. Ugh. I don't know if we're going to have enough delta V for this. But then again, if you're certain you've got enough delta V, odds are you've over engineered the rocket. So again, finger on the control button, one finger on the F button, the other finger's on the WAST keys. trying to keep it pointing retrograde. So this is the point where we want to start slowing down, because otherwise we're just going to start accelerating the opposite direction. So we're just chasing the ball around, and kill, kill, kill. And now we're going straight down. It may not look like it, but we are. So that's the uh, most violent manoeuvre done, so I'm going to extend the solar panels again. Not going to help much, seeing as we're currently blocked, but hey hey. And we want to strike the surface going no faster than about one or two meters a second. But we're not going to start decelerating just yet, so we can make sure that we're pointing retrograde. Always be pointing retrograde, not, not um, straight up. 
If you're pointing straight up, you're not going to be dealing with horizontal velocity. If you're pointing retrograde, you will be dealing with horizontal velocity as well as vertical velocity. So we're getting a bit fast. So I'm just going to burn to slow down our descent a bit. Ideally, you want to be landing on the light side of the moon because that will uh, enable you to actually use your shadow to eyeball your uh, descent a lot more easily. Another nice thing that MechJeb can do is automatically lock you to your prograde or retrograde, meaning you just need to control the burns. But again, according to some people, that's an I win button, so uh, take from that what you will. You can't see much here, unfortunately, but uh, we are descending. We're having to use the altimeter here. You can put lights on the bottom of your uh, lander. Those can aid considerably in... Um, in helping you to actually land because the altimeter yeah it can be a little bit inaccurate again moving a bit fast kill some of that velocity now at this point if we end up with less than about 900 meters per second of delta v we are basically screwed. <laughs> okay. uh, less than 900 meters per second of delta V means that we can't escape the moon and get onto the course back to Kerbin. Alright, ooh, we landed. <laughs> you see what I mean? We still have apparently had a kilometer to go, but uh, let's, whoa, whoa, there we go. We apparently had a kilometre to go, <laughs> but it looks like we've landed on a mountain. So we've struck it at considerable speed. So much speed, in fact, that we've broken off a landing leg. But nevertheless, we landed. That's the important thing. All right, so let's extend the ladder and let's go either. Space to let go. Hey, we have a bouncy, bouncy, happy Kerbal. Now, when you're either, you have a jetpack. Press the Y, press the R button to use it. Shift and Control controls altitude. And um, left, right, and um, WAST controls your other directions. Oh, Kerbal fall down and go boom. You can also jump with the space button. On the moon, you can jump quite high. This actually means that you don't need the ladders, but I always have them for the sake of, uh, shall we say, completeness. You can also right click on your Kerbal and plant the flag. I'll tell you one thing it's a bloody good thing we went with four lines of symmetry instead of three lines of symmetry on those bloody um, landing struts. Okay, we have planted the flag and we can read the plaque. Ah, oh, damn it, we put a spelling mistake on there. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> I'm sure it'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that when you know future generations arrive, they'll forgive us. Right, so let's get back on this horse and see if we can get back to Kerbin. All right. You see here how bloody lucky we are. I don't know how this thing is balancing. I honestly don't. So let's retract the ladder. We have 1,200 metres per second from... Uh, 1,200 metres a second. That should be enough, because whilst I said that the lunar surface to Kerbin would take 1,700 metres per second of delta V, like I said, planning your return trip is a little bit more awkward because what we can do is burn from the moon surface back to Kerbin in one burn. Now the unfortunate thing is that 
I believe the man is tide locked. But that doesn't matter. Yeah. Ideally, what you want to do is. Um, well, there's two ways you can approach it. If you land on the uh, side of the moon which is facing its orbit, it will cost you less delta V to land. Um, but it will cost you more delta V to escape because the moon is essentially chasing you and keeping you in its sphere of influence. If you land on the dark side of the moon, well, not the dark side, but the uh, retrograde side of the moon, then it will cost you more delta V to land because the moon is moving away from you and therefore you have further to go and therefore you need to expend more delta V because you're being accelerated for longer but on the other hand when you take off the moon is uh, the moon is moving away from you and you're moving away from it so you get away from it faster so uh, choose your poison really okay you can now see here this is our landing site in the, in, in the sun so landing on the uh, on the sunny side of the moon usually something of a good idea, <laughs> but uh, we kept control of our descent enough that we didn't completely destroy the ship. We just lost the landing strut. So what we need to do now is get away. Ideally, what I want to do is be here, but because of the fact that the moon is tide locked, it's not ever actually going to change our relative position. So what we're going to do is we're going to go straight up, as in ascend from the moon, and then because there's no atmosphere, we can commence our gravity turn immediately. And what we're going to do is head towards a 270 degree heading. If you look here on the nav ball, you see you've got north, but if you go north, south, west, east, you're going to end up going in the wrong direction. Start thinking in degrees. North, the north line, is essentially zero degrees. Then over this direction is 90 degrees, this is 180, this is 270. So why are we going 270 degrees? Because the moon is heading in that direction. So by going 270 degrees we're using the fact that the moon is moving away from us to help to improve our uh, help to improve our the efficiency of our return. On top of that, what we can do is use the moon's gravity to help pull us around and accelerate us towards Kerbin. So if we burn hard at 270 degrees, we'll get a little bit of a boost from the gravity and that should help us conserve our fuel. And ideally, we're aiming directly for Kerbin. We're not going to be going into low Kerbin orbit, so we save a lot of, um, we save a lot of fuel by not needing to circularize. So you can see now why I said that planning your return trip generally costs a lot less delta V than you'd think, because you can use tricks like this. You don't need to go into a stable orbit. You're just trying to get home. So again, planning with nothing but the nav ball. Let's feather the sass. There we go. And then straight away, just pitch straight over to 270 degrees get the landing gears up. Immediately pitch further over as well because again we need to stick close to the moon if we can because we're trying to use the moon's... you see this we're now very unstable because we've lost that part. Okay, so if we put a node about there for acceleration and you see it takes us 280 delta V that's going to take us back towards the moon so fuck it let's just keep burning yeah didn't quite get that one on the dot but then X as soon as we're escaped so we've escaped lunar orbit. Should have saved really, but I didn't, and I have a feeling that's going to come back and bite me on the backside. And now we're in orbit around Kerbin. And what we want to do is lower our periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere. So if we check the apoapsis here, 
you can see that by expending delta V, we can lower it, and if it takes more than 336, we're screwed. Periapsis 55 kilometers. I'm going to demonstrate aero braking for you. So you see here that um, if we burnt with all of our remaining fuel, we would be able to land on Kerbin. We have enough, just about. So this moon landing was fraught with problems. My ascent was inefficient. I landed on the dark side of the moon, which means that I was I couldn't judge my descent properly using my shadow, which meant that the uh, we lost a, a little bit of um, the ship. Uh, I landed in the worst possible place for a return, which is uh, pretty much right on the very uh, on the side of the moon opposite Kerbin. But because we planned the trip, because we planned to have a little bit more delta V than we needed, we've been able to salvage it. And that's the key. Proper planning. If you plan your trip, you'll be fine. Even, you know, with unfortunate mishaps. So what's this aero braking thing then? Well, I promised that I would show you an aero braking maneuver a while back. So I will show you one now. Essentially, all you need to do is lower your periapsis so it is inside the atmosphere of a planet. So in this case, what I'm going to do is wait until we have, uh, we're have we at the apoapsis node. Now we're burning at the apoapsis because if you burn at the apoapsis or the periapsis, it has the greatest effect on the opposite um, point. So if you burn at the apoapsis, it has the greatest effect on the periapsis. If you were trying to lower your periapsis, you of course burn retrograde. So burning retrograde at the apoapsis will have a much larger impact on your periapsis than burning retrograde, say, uh, halfway between the two. So this is why, again, these tricks for efficiency are what is going to save us. It's scraping those few bits of delta V. So we're about an hour away will burn pretty much on the money. We can't afford to waste a single drop of fuel. So we'll save as I'm coming up to it in case I overshoot. And less than a minute away. There we go. Perfect. So start burning. And what I'm going to do is as soon as the periapsis is lower than 70 kilometers, I'm going to stop. Fudge that one up a bit, but never mind. Um, it'll still work. Actually, no, I'm going to reload. So there we go. Loaded. It's that easy. I'm just going to put the um, maneuver node there as a placeholder. Actually, if I'm going to burn in retrograde, I'll, uh, I'll put it that way. Again, this is why you ease off the throttle as you're approaching the point you want to be at. It's, whilst burning all in one go at full strength is more efficient, you'll often waste less fuel needing to correct yourself later on if you just uh, take that time to begin with. So if I start burning here, then start to ease off the throttle a bit. Finger on the X, ready to kill. There we go. And just a bit more. There we go. 50, 54 kilometers. Save. Okay. So, now what? Well, I'll show you. We essentially warp time. And remember, be careful because of the acceleration. If you keep it to about 100, then when you hit the atmosphere, the game will automatically decelerate you. So there's our beautiful dual Kerbin. Unfortunately, we can't quite get to it. We're almost completely out of fuel, and we can't correct our course to actually land on the damn thing. What are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to let Kerbin itself save us. Somewhat poetic, really. Now, you hit the atmosphere at about 70 kilometers, and oh look, our apoapsis is lowering. Now the reason for this is because the atmosphere is having an impact on our ship's speed due to friction. 
So that friction is slowing our ship down. And what happens if you slow down at your periapsis, you lower your apoapsis. So say you were trying to get into a stable orbit around the planet from this sort of elliptical nature. You just make a few passes to lower your apoapsis down to the altitude where you'd want to circularize. And then you circularize at your apoapsis. OK, so what advantage does this have? Well, as you can see, it is lowering our apoapsis. As your apoapsis lowers, this is essentially a free delta V change. So say, for example, we just landed in the Duna system and we we're at this sort of altitude, this sort of orbit around Duna. By making passes through Duna's atmosphere, we can lower our apoapsis to the altitude that we want to circularize at and then circularize at our apoapsis, raising our periapsis out of the atmosphere. So this means rather than using our engines to adjust the altitude, we're getting that altitude adjustment for free. So let's just check the map screen again. It would probably be wise to retract these panels in the atmosphere. The other thing this does is reduce the overall speed that your ship is moving at. Now, re-entry hasn't actually been modelled yet in terms of the damage that it can do to your ship. However, when it is, what you'll want to do is essentially come in in a very low orbit with an extremely shallow arc, a very shallow gradient going through as much of the atmosphere as possible because that will reduce the speed of your vessel by a huge amount. If you just say, at our, apo if, if at our apoapsis we say just burnt to zero like we did on the moon and then went straight down, the acceleration would be huge. When we hit the atmosphere, the friction would be massive and it would probably burn the ship to a cinder. And even if it didn't burn the ship to a cinder, well, the parachutes would probably be ripped straight off and then the pilots would be smeared into a very, very small puddle. OK, we're now back out of the atmosphere so we can warp again. Hopefully we're not going to hit the moon's sphere of influence. We've lowered our apoapsis down to the point now where we're not really going to hit the moon's SOI. And even if we did, the moon is quite far away. So here we go again, another approach. Once we get down to about uh, 1,000, we can lower the warp. And once we're under 70, our apoapsis should start to crash out. And there it is. Yep, there we go. Apoapsis lowering further again. So I'm going to split the warp up to two because it's still going to have a significant impact. So we could do this uh, repeatedly, just keep making a few passes across um, the atmosphere, shaving off our delta V. And each time we do it, the speed that we hit the atmosphere reduces because obviously we've not ascended to as high of an altitude. And each time we reduce that speed, uh, we reduce the speed that we're going to need to execute re-entry at and reducing the speed we need to execute re-entry at reduces the chance of the ship burning apart. Again, that has not been implemented at the time of the tutorial, but uh, you know, if you're watching this tutorial after that patch, well, congratulations, we've, uh, we've jumped the gun a bit. So we're spending more time in the atmosphere now, so our speed is coming down quite nicely. And you see we're now starting to ascend again. Now we do have a tiny amount of fuel left in the tank. If we executed that burn at our apoapsis now, then we could probably actually come in for a landing. So I've demonstrated adequately, I think, how an aerobraking manoeuvre works and the effect that it can have. We'll actually show you an aerobrake with circularization at some point as well. But for now, you've seen the basic principle, it's a free delta V change. So at our apoapsis, we're just going to use the last of our fuel to burn retrograde and that should be enough to, to bring us back into Kerbin. We can bring our boys home.
obviously this manoeuvre would actually kill them in real life and will probably kill them if, as I say, that re-entry patch has been applied. But it hasn't been applied yet and this tutorial has already run on for far too long. So let's expend all the fuel we have left in a retrograde burn. That was it. <laughs> and you'll see that we now have a course into curving. Now what we could have done is, to try and be safe even with that tiny amount of fuel, is bring the altitude to about, say, ooh, 45, 40 kilometers, maybe even a tad lower. And as the atmosphere gets thicker, the braking effect increases. The idea is to go through as much of the thin atmosphere as possible, because that will slow you down more slowly, meaning when the thicker atmosphere slows you down more quickly, you're not going to be decelerating as fast and therefore you're not going to be subject to as much friction and also you're not going to be subject to as much g-force. Now again, g-force is still something that's not been implemented. Your Kerbals can survive an ungodly amount of g-force, so no need to worry too much about that. And what's g-force? I suppose we should explain g-force. G-force is uh, the force which is put on your body when you accelerate or decelerate. The example most people will be familiar with is if you're standing in a lift and when the lift moves down you suddenly feel a lot lighter, you're experiencing what's called negative G-force. You're accelerating downwards and for a moment you've actually essentially become lighter. The force you are exerting downwards is reduced but then the earth accelerates you and you catch up with the lift. And the same in negative. If you're standing in a lift that goes up, you may suddenly feel mm, you know, like you've suddenly become a lot heavier. So that is a positive G. Um, the lift moving upwards is essentially almost increasing your weight. It's not actually increasing your weight, but that's sort of the effect. So. 1g is equal to the force that the Earth exerts on you. So if you can imagine what 15g's does. 15g's essentially means that suddenly you weigh 15 times more than you do. You know, uh, gets to a point where you start to collapse under your own weight. So again, that's not been implemented. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. What has been implemented though is staging. And now that we're on return course, you can jettison that engine. We have our pod, we have our parachute, and uh, we are on course for that beautiful jewel that is Kerbin. Now again, we want to be careful with the warp, because if we hit the atmosphere at high warp speeds, then um, it would be bad. Remember, warp amplifies a lot of the forces involved in this game, so consequently, when you warp, if your ship is subject to any sorts of forces, even rotational forces from SAS modules, the end result can be unpleasant. So we're hitting the atmosphere at a steep angle and a high speed. This is basically suicide. This is um, the sort of manoeuvre that will destroy ships. Nevertheless, it's so much fun. <laughs> with some inkling to safety, we'll try and point the bloody thing retrograde. So we just got our sass onto kill rot. So hopefully the bottom of the ship now will take all the brunt of the re-entry. Let's see if we can get a stupid speed here. And there's the friction creating heat. And all of our speed is being converted into heat. So the faster you're going, the higher the heat, the more deadly the effect. You see now we're starting to decelerate to a more reasonable speed. The half-deployed parachute has increased our drag nicely. Now the parachute has deployed. We're at a nice, safe speed of 6.2 metres. And there we have it. Uh, all we've got to do now is just wait for the uh, pod to land. Fortunately, they do float. And essentially, that's it. We have completed our first successful 
trip to the Mun and back. This is a major milestone for any Kerbal player. It's the first time that you've set foot on another body and been able to return the uh, offending character. So, give yourself a pat on the back if you've managed to achieve this, and I hope these tutorials have helped you. Next week, we're going to look at mods. We're going to look at some of the mods that are available, how to install them and what they can add to the game, and which mods are right for you. After that, we're going to take a trip to Minmus, and once we've taken a trip to Minmus, I think this 101 series is over. Oh, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop making these videos. It just means that we're going to move on to something a bit more advanced. Does anybody fancy a return trip to Duna? I hear it's pretty nice this time of year. Splashdown. Well, for now, I'm Evis T, signing off.